Ministries, or Sela Fellowship. And um, we uh, greet you as you come to join us this afternoon as we try to continue our Lenten study that we began uh, earlier this, this Lenten season, but was inter interrupted by the COVID-19 virus threat. I pray and hope that you are keeping yourself safe and at a distance from uh, infection, but at the same time, um, I thank you that you are joining me, with me uh, via live video. Uh, we just ended the study. I had about uh, four or five people here that were doing the study with us, and it was some technical error uh, because it was me who uh, made it to go live but didn't press the right button. So they now have all left, <laughs> and so um, I'm now going live now so that you could participate in this study that we began uh, back uh, the week after Ash Wednesday. Um, as we do so, I want to bring us up to date uh, in our study. So uh, the two different groups were at different places within the study uh, before this interruption happened with the virus threat. Um, but we um, want to be on the same page. So uh, what we are doing is that we're considering the question of why is the cross the central and identifying feature of Christianity? Whenever you think of Christianity, you think of the cross. Uh, we have it in most sanctuaries. Uh, people love to wear it as jewelry. Um, there are people who will cling on to the cross when they're in the hospital during a time of need. The cross seems to be the central identifying um, signature of Christianity. We might realize and understand and accept that, um, but you might think of the fact that we are really people of the resurrection. Why do we look at the cross, which is the death of Jesus, rather than looking at the resurrection? Well, without the cross, there is not a resurrection. And likewise, with our, our experiencing of a cross, then there is no also resurrection for ourselves. So that's one reason why it's very important. Um, so there are several technical terms that are used to describe the work of the cross in our salvation. And these are atonement, sacrifice, expiation, justification, propitiation, reconciliation, and redemption. Those are terms that we use within the church and religion. However, um, just as engineers will have their own lingo or other uh, professions have their particular language, so this represents some of the language that's part of Christianity. But we use it, but sometimes we take it for granted, and we don't really comprehend what it really means. So our study, which I uh, did several years ago and wrote up, um, we have done within this Lenten season, um, focusing on those particular words used to describe the work of the cross. There's a couple of them that make it kind of funny. Expiation. Whenever I think of expiation, I think of supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, which has nothing to do with that. But expiation means to get rid of. So somehow on the cross, it gets rid of our sin. So that's what we claim. Uh, there's also another word, propitiation, uh, which is a different word. We don't banter around too much. But propitiation um, means basically to appease. And that word is important um, as we look at uh, sacrifices and what they mean. And... Uh, I do not think it's really a word that describes the Christian, Christian understanding of the cross. We do not try to appease God. That is how other nations and cultures, ancient cultures, used their sacrificial system, was to appease a deity. The words we're going to focus on uh, in the study and have focused on, but I'm going to bring it all together uh, today, are the five words, atonement, sacrifice, justification, 
reconciliation and redemption. The beginning of our need for the cross needs to be understood in order for us to understand the work of the cross. And so we began our study looking at the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. There we find that humanity is made in God's image, which I find evidence in three essential qualities. The first is defined in our creative capacity. Like God compared to all the rest of creation, we have been endowed with a particular capacity to create. While we do not create from nothing as God did, we do create from what God has made. And as opposed to other creatures that God has made, we can take wonderful things and build, build buildings. We can create music. We can create art. We have a creative capacity that surpasses that of any other creature that we find within creation. So we have that creative capacity. The second thing I find is that we have divine authority. God shared the authority with humanity. He said, go and have dominion over all that I have created. So there's creative capacity, there's divine authority, and the last is a freedom of will. Now, each of these capacities um, ha are limited, and they all are related to one another. We find that with human sin and evil, when it entered into the scene of the description of Genesis, the beginning of all things, um, we find that the sin involved the misuse of our creative capacity. It also uh, revealed that we misused our divine given authority. And likewise, it was an act of free will. And so these three things interact together. And even though it's an ancient story, yet it is also still something that is very active within our lives today. Chapter three describes the fall of humanity. That means a fall from grace just as much as you might think if you have a friendship and something went wrong, that there would be a fall in that relationship. There is some obstruction, some problem that happened. And so the relationship has been affected. Uh, and that fall, which is falling from grace in Christ, in God, uh, resulted in human depravity. And that is kind of our focus. Uh, by the fall, we mean our separation from God. And by our depravity, we mean our incapacity for making things right. That's the, where we live today. We live as a result of the fall in a broken world, suffering from depravity, meaning the whole creation has been impacted. It's not the way God intended. And human life is not the way God intended it to be nor is our relationship with God as it should be. And because of that, there is a sentence of death. Um, there's a death that naturally comes in our relationship with God because we are separated from God because of our misuse of our human freedom and our rebellion against God. We didn't allow God to be God, but we chose to be God. And that basically is a description of our human sin. Our incapacitation means that from, from that time on with the fall, that each human being is born into the world without a relationship with the author of life, with God. And so what happens is we are then living within ourselves, within the circumstances of our environment, and we find our way. And we become the center of our own world. And everything we do and choose revolves around our need to provide for ourselves, survival of the fittest um, to a certain degree. And that is always true. And so what happens is that we live in this frustrated environment. We can find that um, the tempter in the story of Genesis or the serpent 
held up before the hum human beings the benefit of eating the fruit. The serpent said, certainly when you eat of this fruit, you will become like God in comprehending what is good from what is evil. When I had a few people here, we asked that question and they gave some wonderful answers. And I wish that they were here now, but um, my mistake, and I apologize for that. But we have to ask the question, why wouldn't God want this for us? After all, God made us in God's image. Why wouldn't God then want us to become like God in being able to comprehend good and evil? The reason for that is while we may have creative capacity, while we may have a measure of divine authority, while we have freedom of will, still everything that we are capable of doing needs to be in submission to God who created us and for who God who created us for a specific purpose, where we recognize and worship God as God. And so our being able to discern between good and evil means that we make ourselves into God. We then replace God. And that's not our role in being created. We are not to replace God, but always to live our lives under the authority and defining of God. So that's where we find ourselves. Um, Eve was deceived while Adam chose willfully to rebel against God's rightful authority. So there's a difference. There's two ways in which we enter into sin and evil in our lives. One is that we are deceived. We have misinformation or we define or understand something um, in a, an inappropriate way. And so we base our decisions upon what we know. But if what we know is corrupted or misinformed, then we will make the wrong decision. And that's what we find within that story in Genesis. However, Adam was not deceived. Adam realized and knew fully what God wanted. But Adam chose to sin. And we talked about in our earlier studies about uh, what the motivation was and what the difference was. But I'm summarizing to get us to a place where we can continue our study um, at this point in time. So while they were, they, Adam was the one who chose to sin, we also find that this explains the reason why history, and particularly the Apostle Paul in later generations, claimed we sinned through Adam and not through Eve. And I'm not going to read those passages for us now, but uh, two passages you might be able to read are Romans 5, verse 14, and also 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. We have to ask ourselves, why do we sin uh, through Adam and not through Eve? It's because Adam used his freedom of choice willfully to sin. And we also uh, do, this, do similar in that we then sometimes sin, though we know and suspect it's wrong in our own heart and thinking, but we choose to do it for various reasons. It is a choice. Sin is a choice. But sin is also something that is not a choice in that we are, find ourselves incapacitated by our depravity. So we live in a broken world where sin and selfishness predominates us. That comes a little bit later in our understanding of some of the words that we use to define the power and use of the cross in our lives. The result of their awareness of wrongdoing or their guilt and shame was their hiding from God and making for themselves insufficient coverings for their nakedness. So what they did is they hid from God because they knew they were wrong. And the human beings then made used what resources they had available to try to cover up for their sin. We also try to hide from God. We cover ourselves. Uh, some people hide from God because uh, by 
uh, having a difficulty in prayer. Uh, in prayer, we confront God. We speak with God. We meet God. And all of a sudden in prayer, when we meet God, we are first um, are exposed in our sin. We realize that we are not who we should be. So in order to not face who we are, we oftentimes try to hide from God. And that means avoidance from prayer. We may avoid worship too, because in worship we come to be confronted with the reality of God. And when we do so, we then face our own infallibility, our, excuse me, our fallibility in our incapability to be what we were created to be. So the best way is just to avoid a religion, a worship, or prayer. It's just one of the obstacles. There's many others that we could cite, but that's just an example of why some people have some spiritual or religious uh, difficulty. They tried to hide. They tried to make coverings for themselves. And what that means is that they justified their own sinfulness. We use all sorts of defense mechanisms to either deny or justify ourselves or to transfer blame for our mistakes and our wrong choices to other places. Within the story of Genesis, uh, we find that Adam uh, blamed both the woman and also God who created the woman. Um, also, uh, then the woman blamed uh, the serpent whom God had made. Um, so what happens is we tend to blame God. We blame others, but we don't take responsibility for our own choices and our own actions. Realizing their own guilt and shame, uh, humanity then used the best resources they had available to them, um, and they created insufficient coverings for themselves. When God sought them out, because the purpose of God is to have fellowship with humanity, uh, found that they were hiding, um, God realized that they were naked, they were exposed, and they had done something that he had forbidden. They uh, had made coverings for themselves. God then covered them by making the first sacrifice. God took an animal, which God had created, and then used the hides to create a covering for the man and the woman. That was, and I think it's important to remember, that was the first sacrifice. And it's important to point out that it wasn't a sacrifice that humanity made for God. So it's not propitiation. It's not appeasement of God. Rather, it was God who made the sacrifice. Think about that for a moment, if you please. It is very important. God made the sacrifice. In all other religions and all other ancient cultures that there is a sacrificial system. Realize it was human beings who was making the sacrifice to appease or propitiate a deity. Here within Genesis, we find that God makes the sacrifice. We also find that the sacrifice is very valuable. All life is valuable to God. Yet because of human error, God, in order to cover humanity had to take a sacrifice of a life. The sacrifice then represents for us the costliness of our errors and our sin. There's a price to be paid. We pay the price. Other people who share our lives, they pay that price. And ultimately, humanity pays that price as pain and suffering and sorrow. And we see that evident in our world. We don't have to argue or try to explain that. We just know that. We see that. And it's because of human sinfulness and selfishness which did that. So we find that there is an atonement that is made. We call that um, 
covering the killing of that animal, whatever animal it was, to make the garments to cover the man and woman, we find that that was a sacrifice of atonement. Now, atonement means many things. Most naturally, atonement, when we hear that word, uh, means, okay, you've got to atone for this. It means you've got to make up for it. And the real question here is, can we ever really make up for something, some hurt that we have caused another? When a word is spoken that's harsh and abusive and unjust, can it ever be taken back? You know, we can try to make up for it by doing better, by doing good to the person that we feel that we have hurt. But we really can't make up for it. It is always there. So it means to make amends. Can I make up for this? It might be reinforced in us by the fact as parents, when a child has done something wrong, we give them a way out uh, by trying to give them some good things to do. And if they do those things, then, you know, they're left off the hook. But then we transfer that understanding to God. The atonement means to make amends. It also means to cover over. So the good, we hope, will cover over the bad we have done. And that's how some people look at their Christian lives. I have this checkoff list. I do this, 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 this. If I do good, then now make up for the wrong that I've done. So hopefully I've done more good than I have wrong. And that's a game we play, but it's insufficient. It's not correct. Uh, there's no amount of good that we can do to make up for the hurt and the wrong that we have done. And so it also means, literally, atonement to become at one again. Atonement to become at one again. We have a broken relationship with God. We have a broken relationship with with. Um, creation, and we have a broken relationship um, with others, and so that influences us. Excuse me, I gotta do something on the screen here. Thank you. So we find that we're in a state of that brokenness, and what happens is that only God can um, provide that atonement or that sacrifice. And so God uncovers their sin. You can't hide from God. And makes a more sufficient covering than what they could have made for themselves of animal skins, requiring the first sacrifice. That leads us into discussion of then with atonement and sacrifice uh, by looking at uh, the Jewish sacrificial system. We understand in the Old Testament that God then required uh, through Moses that there would be a sacrifice, a sacrificial system. We find even before Moses there was examples of sacrifice. Even uh, Abram, Abraham uh, offered a sacrifice. We also then have to ask ourselves why. Uh, it seems archaic. It seems um, superstitious seems something of the past and something that should not be within our contemporary understanding of human life we have to understand that when god called abraham to faith that god was calling a man that came from other cultures sacrifices have been a part of ancient cultures their religious practices from its beginnings from as far back as we can tell but what God did was take that which was common in understanding to the ancients and redefined it. God took the sacrifices, which were meant to appease the gods or to earn and court favor with the gods and rather turn them around. It was God who provided the sacrifice. Any creature that might have been provided uh, been sacrificed, had been originally created and provided by God. 
So actually it was what the animals that were brought to sacrifice were those who actually belonged to God. And it involved our recognition that all of life, all the gifts that God has given to us, are that, given to us. And they're not ours to give, but ours to return back to God. I'm sure you can take that meaning and, and apply that to um, our religious practice today. God also changed the, the subject of sacrifice around from the ancient periods. Uh, for instance, like in Abram having to sacrifice his only son, uh, Isaac. We find that uh, God asked him to do that, but then stayed his hand. We have to ask why. Because God was showing that the sacrifice of children, which was common in other cultures, uh, was not part of the Jewish and the understanding or Hebrew understanding of what God wanted for people. Rather, the, the sacrifice stood for something else altogether. Here are some questions to think about as we enter into this brief study. How does Christ's death make up for what we have done? Repeat that. How does Christ's death make up for what we have done? What is necessary to forgive our sin? And talking about the sacrifice, we have to ask ourselves, if the blood of sacrifices of the Old Testament could never really take away sin, as Hebrews 10, 1 through 18 tell us, what real purpose did the sacrifices serve? What is sacrificed whenever we forgive others? Those are important questions that I'd ask you to, to think about and reflect upon. The first passage was Hebrews 10, and I want to share that with you. We did so as before this COVID uh, um, virus interrupted our meeting together. We looked at Hebrews chapter 10, and I want to uh, revisit that just because uh, some of you that may be joining us uh, may not have been there for that study of that passage. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. So the sacrifices of the Old Testament are a shadow of what God was doing. Um, I would say that was a, a religious or spiritual evolution. That God had an end plan in mind and was taking humanity where God found humanity and progressively changing them and their understanding to bring them to the point of the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeatedly, repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all, and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins, because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them although the law required them to be made. Now that's a question. Why would God require them even though they were insufficient? Again, I bring you back to the thought of the evolution of religious thought and practice by acknowledging that they represented something else in preparing us for the greater sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. And that's exactly what Jesus did 
in the Garden of Gethsemane, if you remember. He said, Lord, if you can take away this cup of poison from me, then do so. But if it isn't, then I'll do your will. And for those who follow Christ, that is also our prayer. Though I prefer this and not have to go through this, yet if I have to, I will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, the priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But when is this priest, meaning Jesus, had offered um, himself for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Because of one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And so he lays apart aside the one for the other. <coughs> Excuse me. So we find that the sacrificial system, why did God desire that? I said it was like an evolution um, of religious thought, a preparation of us for that offering. What we find in the, in the offerings in the Old Testament that it had to be a male and uh, the best of the flock um, and perfect. And so we find that that was what was offered. The animal was to represent the sin of the person who was making the offering. It was also that sometimes they would grab the horns of a bull and they would then they believe, transfer their sins from themselves into the animal. Of course, that's not what happened. What was really pleasing to God was the sincerity of the intention. If there was a recognition uh, of wrongdoing, of sin, and there was a desire to get rid of it, and a desire to be free from it, then that's what God saw, not the sacrifice of the bull or the animal. What the animal, animal represented was the cost. There is a life. And so when we forgive, it's costly. It represented also the pain that God had to sacrifice something living in order to cover over our sinfulness. It was costly for the individual who was making the offering because it was the best. They'd want to use the best in order to advance their herd, but they gave the first and they gave the best. And if we look at Christ, we find the same thing happens. Jesus was God's first son. Jesus was the best. and that God offered then the perfect back to God. So that Jesus could say that God, God we could say that Jesus was God's a perfect offering to God. So it represented both the pain that God experienced through our rebellion and the costliness of God sacrificing his son later in history. And it also represents, third, the sacrifice we must make in the surrender of our lives to God, which is the ultimate purpose for the sacrifices and what God was trying to work out in our lives. There are several other words that we must look at, and that was the sacrifice or the atonement. Um, in a way, what happens is that um, Jesus, who was the first, the best, was also a human being. So where humanity was incapable of being faithful. That's not true when Jesus came. Because all of a sudden we find that Jesus was fully God, but fully human. 
and Jesus fulfilled God's will perfectly. So God is basically saying, when I look at the sacrifice of my son Jesus, I then see not our sins, but I see then my son and the perfectness of Jesus. So Jesus' faithfulness covers over our unfaithfulness. And God sees us through the eyes of Jesus. That's another meaning that we oftentimes find in describing the cross as referring to Jesus as being the substitute, our substitute. He was a substitute for our sin. He died for our sins. He didn't deserve to die. He was without sin, but he also took upon himself the cross and died as a result of human sin. There's another word that uh, we use besides atonement and sacrifice, and that is reconciliation. And reconciliation is a relational term. And I would draw your attention to Romans 5, and I'd also draw your attention to Colossians 1, verses 13 through 23. So in Romans 5, which we won't talk about 1 Corinthians, but we'll talk about Romans 5, we find this description. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, there's a word we need to remember, justified. That's another description of the work of the cross. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our, in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Now the endurance and perseverance that he's talking about in the sufferings are those that we struggle with with ourselves in our human frailty, in our human sinfulness. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since now we have been justified by his blood, there's that word justified again, which we'll talk about in just a moment. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? And if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled, there's that other word to describe the work of the cross, to him through the blood of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So at least three times we find the word reconciliation used. It's a relational term. It's a relational term in, in, um, best understood in a human relationships. If I've done something wrong, if I've offended someone, then that relationship has been broken. And in breaking that relationship, what must it take to be reconciled? That's the important thing. The other word that was used in this passage is that of the word justified, which is a legal term. And we'll get to that. But reconciliation is where we find that um, we have been brought back into relationship with God. What must we do? to be reconciled in a broken relationship. Well, we have to have, first of all, someone that's, that values the relationship to be able to want that relationship to be reconciled. And so that's why the importance that Jesus said that unless you forgive, you cannot be forgiven. So we need to be able to, to in order to be reconciled with someone, we need to have than a willing partner who wants to be reconciled to us. God values us so much. We're worth so much to God that God wants rec reconciliation. 
The question is whether we want reconciliation with God. Do we value God enough? Do we value that relationship with God enough to do that which it takes to be reconciled with God? Now, what does it take as far as on the offender side to be reconciled in a broken relationship? First, there has to be an awareness that that relationship and that our actions and choices have broken that relationship. There has to be a desire that that relationship means more to us, is the most important thing to us, that we want that relationship back. Then thirdly, it takes our confessing our role in damaging that relationship. Humility, confession. We own up to what we have done. And then there's another thing that is added to that, which is repentance. Repentance is that I hate the fact of what I did to hurt someone else. And so I commit myself to not doing it again. If we are able to show our awareness, and our humility, our earnestness, we confess our sin, we're really sorry, and we prove that we're really sorry by our repentance, perhaps the other person in that relationship will then forgive us. And our relationship can be reconciled. That's exactly what God has done to us. God has, has pursued us throughout human history. God has desired reconciliation with us, though we're the ones that broke that relationship through the misuse of our freedom of choice. God does all that God can do through human history, through human experience, through the sacrificial system, through calling a people apart for him, the Jews, to revealing then a savior who can then uh, be the relationship. God has done all that God can do. Now it's turned back upon us. It is, do we have the desire for that relationship? If it's not important to us, we won't care. Do we recognize our own culpability? Are we willing to confess that wrongdoing to God? And are we willing then to repent? Do we turn away from that evil that broke the relationship in the first place? That we might pursue that relationship without repeating the evil that we did. That is what reconciliation is. God pursued us. God showed us our value by having his only son die on the cross. And in that death, then, we see God's love for us. And that should instill in us a sense of gratitude, a gratitude which means that I want to pursue that relationship with God. And I'll do whatever it takes to have that relationship restored. That's what reconciliation is. God has reconciled us to himself if we are willing to pay the price, which is submitting ourselves or surrendering our lives back to God and allowing God to be God again. That's as simple as what it means. We also have the other word in here, which is justified. The justified is a legal term. And that's important uh, that we look at being justified. And we look at justification in uh, Romans chapter 3. And again, we look at the uh, book of Romans because uh, of all the other letters in the New Testament, uh, Paul's letter to the Romans is the most theological. And so we define most of our theology through what Paul wrote in Romans on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so what he writes in Romans chapter 3, beginning uh, with verse 21, is this. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. So 
on, uh, on the prophets of the Old Testament were to testify to the coming of Christ and the work of Christ on the cross. It is also that which reveals sin. So it shows us who we really are and our need for grace. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, every one of us. No matter how good we may think we are compared to others, comparative righteousness doesn't lead us to salvation. I may live better. I might have a better uh, upbringing. I might have better experiences in my life that makes me a person that is considered by my peers to be good and righteous and holy. But the best of us are still sinners and fail to make the mark that God has set. We fall short of the glory or the perfection that we know is in God himself. And are justified, there's that word, freely by his grace, justified by his grace. Through the redemption, that's another word we'll talk about, the last one, that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. There's that atonement and that sacrifice again through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice before because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be the just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So where is the boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from observing the law. And those are important concepts. We find most of those words that we're looking at to describe the cross here within this brief passage of Scripture. So we find a sacrifice of atonement. We discussed that. We discuss reconciliation, the intention of God to be reconciled with us. But we also find the word justified. Justified is a legal term. And what it stands for is that uh, just as much as we might look at the uh, um, Statue of Liberty, we find in one hand there is scales of justice. And so we know the scales have two sides to it. On this side, we could place all the evils of the world all our personal sins on one side. And the balance of the scales is tipped to our guilty verdict. Then there's the other side. And on that side, we can put our good works, our best of intentions, um, all the things that are good in our lives. We could list them. We could say, well, I, why should I have entrance into heaven, into God's kingdom? Well, because I was a good father, well, pretty good. I was a good husband most of the time. I was a good citizen. I was good, good. You know, we could list those things, but they're never enough to tip the scales. Never enough because we are imperfect. And God expects perfect perfection because God is perfection. That's the glory of God is God's perfection. God is perfectly just as well as God is merciful. So in God's justice, there has to be a penalty that is paid. But God is also perfectly merciful. So in other words, God wants to have mercy. So in order to balance the scales of justice, God had to make sure that is Jesus. Jesus was fully human. Jesus was fully divine. So who died on the cross was none other than Jesus. But Jesus was perfect without sin, without blame. So that justice, you can think of justice as a separate personality, that justice cannot accuse God of being unfair because a penalty was paid. Humanity is not imperfect anymore because Jesus 
was perfectly human and perfectly God, died without sin. So it balanced the scales. So in that way, we could say that Jesus died for us and legally, in a legal sense, balanced the scales of justice, of eternal justice, is another way of looking at that. There's another word that's in here. It's called redemption. And I would not going to read it for you today, but I would have you to look it up for yourselves and read it. It's Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 23. But he says here in this, in this uh, Romans chapter 3, he says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified, we talked about that, freely by his grace through the redemption that came in Christ Jesus. Now, what do we mean by redemption? Um, we experience redemption in many different ways. Uh, downstairs in the church, while we were having church, um, able to meet together, people would bring bottles and cans and place them in a bin. Those bottles and cans um, are empty and cleaned out and will be taken and be redeemed. They'll be exchanged for money which shall then be used to provide camperships for children to be able to go to a camp. Going to camp is expensive. Many parents cannot afford it, particularly if they have multiple children. So it's an attempt to provide camperships for them. The point is, is that those cans and bottles are redeemed. They have a value. We turn them in, and all of a sudden, then what happens is that we receive something back. Um, we are redeemed when we believe in Jesus Christ and accept his sacrifice for our sins, when we make a heartfelt, true uh, um, profession of faith and desire to be set free from sin, we then are redeemed. In other words, sometimes it is said that Jesus paid the price for us. That also means uh, regarding slavery. In those days, there were servants and there were slaves. The term is oftentimes used interchangeable. And what in Romans chapter 6 says is that we were sold as slaves to sin. And that's what we are. In other words, we're addicted to our sinfulness. From the beginning of our lives, we are born. We don't know God. We all of a sudden see those who are caring for us. And we don't really learn to love them as much as we do at first. I'm hungry. I'm wet. I need to be fed. I need to be changed. And while we may learn to love those who care for us at the same time, we start out with a self-centeredness and we reinforce that self-centeredness until we become addicted to self-centeredness. So we can become addicted to our sins. And we are addicted to our sins. We can even be addicted to religion, and which can be equally wrong because it may not be legitimate. It may not be uh, motivated with a desire that religion is intended to instill within us. We become addicted. We are addictive creatures. And every one of us are addicted to something. Every one of us. But particularly, we're all addicted to sinfulness and selfishness. So what he did is Jesus paid the price. He was not addicted to selfishness. He showed selflessness to the point that he was allowed to be abused. He was allowed, he allowed himself to be crucified unjustly, punished. And so by that, he paid the price so that we can be won back from our addiction. Now, how does that take place? If I recognize the love of God for me, if I recognize the cost that God had to pay through Jesus, his son, it should fill me with gratitude. It should fill me with remorse that my sin, 
made it necessary for Jesus to die. I then not only desire that forgiveness and to be reconciled with God, but I also reject that addiction that is held onto me and keeps me trapped. I therefore am released from the guilt and shame and I'm enabled then to live for God by following Jesus Christ. My life has been changed. In Romans chapter 6, he compares it to baptism. Whereas when we are baptized in Christ, we are baptized into his death. In other words, when we go into the water, we make a choice to go into the water to be baptized. We make a commitment. And so when we come out of the water, when we go into the water, it's like our old person with our addiction has died. When we come up out of the water, we then are come out as looking the same person, being the same person in many ways, except we have a different orientation to live for God through Jesus Christ. And so the desire to be different the desire to live to the potential that God has instilled in us is that which redeems us from sin. Now, we have to be honest that while we live in this life, in this world, that we do not shake off our addiction fully. We improve ourselves. We rely upon the gift of God that comes to us through our reconciliation. If we're reconciled to God, then God can have fellowship with us. And God does that through the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit is able to live within each believer, each follower of Christ. And likewise, we live in Christ. It's a mystery, but there's a spiritual presence that abides and, and lives within us. And that spirit helps us in our weakness. That spirit helps empower us in our efforts to repent of the sin that broke our relationship from, with God in the first place. What's important is that what God sees is Jesus. God doesn't see our sin. And with the Spirit's help, we then are able to reclaim our lives. We are able to grow in holiness and righteousness. It's not that we're already perfect because we still live in this broken, imperfect, and corrupted world that God will reclaim also. So we, we read in the book of Revelation, a new heaven, a new earth. Meanwhile, we struggle and strive with ourselves, with the world, with the temptations of the world. But you know, that's what is important to God is that we're striving to be free. Not because God demands it, but because we want it. Because what God wanted to see within us and create us to be able to do, we now want for ourselves. The cross represents that struggle, that fight, with our own self, with our sinfulness. It's one reason why Jesus, in one place, Matthew and a couple of the other Gospels said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, deny myself the right to define my life and be my own God. Pick up their cross. This is my life. This is what's influenced me, made me who I am. This is the struggle that I have both physically, mentally, and spiritually. I pick up my cross in order to follow. So Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow me. That's one reason why the cross is so central in identifying who we are, because that's what we live now. I'm going to be resurrected just as Christ was resurrected. Matter of fact, the guarantee of that resurrection I possess now, you possess that also by faith. I have the hope of the resurrection because the Spirit of God now lives within inside of us and helps us, comforts us, encourages us, empowers us, 
in our struggle against the evils in our own lives and the world. But someday, important time, that I will be resurrected, you will be resurrected, and we won't have that struggle any further. But what is important is what God sees, is that God sees our faithfulness, not where we fail. God reads the heart and knows the heart of the person who is sincere in wanting to follow Jesus Christ and to fulfill God's will in their life. So that's, that's the meaning of, those, of the cross for us. The cross is what we live under, we follow. So those are the meanings of atonement, sacrifice, of justification, reconciliation, and redemption. And whether you have been aware of the meaning of the cross in your life or not, I pray that you have. And I hope that understanding it more fully gives you a greater appreciation and a greater hunger to be righteous and holy, to live your life pleasing to God. And if you haven't made that commitment, if you are still addicted and wish to be free, I'd ask that you might pray with me. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you loved me so much, that you sent your own son, Jesus, to die for my sins, that I might be forgiven, that I might be reclaimed by you, and that I might live my life for you, and not just for you, but for myself because I want most in my life to please you. I take the cross as my standard. I will pick up my cross. I will surrender my life to you. And I choose this day, this moment in time, to follow you with who I am, where I am, Looking forward to the time you'll create me, create me into the person that you envision me to be. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the hope that you give me. With this, we pray in the name and in the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you for joining me with this study. Next week, we'll uh, probably broadcast on a Wednesday afternoon, and we'll be looking at a particular story that Jesus told, um, oftentimes called the prodigal son in Luke 17, to be, be able to further deepen our understanding and appreciation of living our life beneath the cross of Jesus. Have a good day. God bless.